Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him. They went up on a high mountain where they could be alone. There in front of the disciples, Jesus was completely changed. And his clothes became much whiter than any bleach on earth could make them. And Moses and Elijah were there, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Teacher, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But Peter and the others were terribly frightened. And they did not know what he was talking about. The shadow of a cloud passed over and covered them. From the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, and I love him. Listen to what he says. At once, the disciples looked around, and they saw only Jesus. As Jesus and his disciples were coming down the mountain, he told them not to say a word about what they had seen, until the Son of Man had been raised from death. Good morning. Good morning. Let's pray for a minute. Lord, we're, we're on the mountain with you. Please descend upon us in this cloud and fill our hearts and our lives with your presence. Amen. Transfiguration Sunday. A sp almost a spooky day in some respects, you know. Some of the people go up on the mountain and, and strange things happen. So, and I don't know, I'll confess, I haven't quite always known what to do with this Sunday. You know, it's, if somebody's healed or, or fed, I can figure that out. But transfiguration, well. But we have this Jewish teacher, Jesus, and of course we know all he's done. He's, yeah, he's been out healing people he, he's been casting demons out of people. He's been feeding 5,000. Oh, you know, he's calmed the winds and the waves on seas. Just all this kind of wonderful stuff. But in today's gospel, here the glory of the Lord, the glory of God, uh, comes upon him uh, on this mountain. Now, all these other things that Jesus have done, I, they're wonderful and beautiful, but here it's a bright light, almost, you know, like this, looking up, and it shines down. And Moses and Elijah are there. Oh. And then comes the voice of God out of that cloud that descends. And this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Well, if you had been on that mountain on that day, uh, well, what effect would this have had upon you? This whole thing. I mean, you go, hmm. But I think we have an idea of how it would have affected us with Peter. Because Peter was there, and here's what he wrote in his second letter, the second letter of Peter. He wrote, with our own eyes, we saw his greatness we were there when he was given honor and glory by God the Father. And when the voice said, This is my own dear Son with whom I am pleased. We ourselves heard this voice coming from the mountain when we were with him on the holy mountain. So the transfiguration impressed Peter, very much impressed him. An unforgettable experience for him, I think. You know, it was just imprinted upon him. So Jesus moved on this day, I think. He was not just miracle worker or exerciser of demons or even a good preacher or a good teacher. No, Jesus on this day for Peter became the son of God. And he said, this is God's son. And Peter just knew this for himself. And, and Peter's identity, let's say, before was a little, maybe a little strange, but now Peter's identity was in Christ. 
right there. I mean, he looked at Jesus. Now, did Peter still continue to have other struggles and doubts and troubles as he went on? Oh, yeah. But boy, he never forgot this day. Now, it was unforgettable. He knew his identity in Jesus would never be shaken. I think our world wants this kind of a transfiguration, if you will. We want this sort of thing for ourselves like it was for Peter. And I think, yeah, we do need to get transfigured out of our, our muddled self, our coddled self, our oversensitive self, if you will. And we need to, get, need to be transfigured into the humble servants of Jesus Christ and his church. So how does transfiguration come about? Ah, the way I thought about this was I was thinking of, of taking a journey, if you will, that we, you know, we, we go on journeys and these journeys kind of transfigure us. So let me explain here. Now, all of us take little trips. You know, you say, well, we're going to go to Chicago for the weekend or we're going to go skiing in the mountains of Pennsylvania or New York for the weekend or a different kind of a journey. I just had the flu for two weeks and it was terrible. That was a journey too, right? Yeah. Anyway, that's the kind of journeys I'm thinking about. And of course, we're completing today the journey of Epiphany. We've been on it since uh, the 6th of uh, January. And uh, we've walked through Epiphany with Christ. Now, and, and of course, we're looking farther down the road. Maybe we're thinking, oh, this summer we're going to take this trip and we're planning it, right? Or even just maybe in April, you say, oh, in April, right after Easter, it's going to be a little warmer and we're going to take a little trip then. Good, good. Uh, and that's fine. But now we're kind of ready to set off on a 40-day journey, and it's called Lent. No, not Lent. <laughs> Lent, <laughs> L-E-N-T. And, and in this 40-day journey, Jesus, of course, is our tour guide and our teacher. He's leading us on the journey. And we have to trust him like we did in Epiphany. So Transfiguration Sunday is kind of a staging point for this trip, for this 40-day Lenten journey. And if you've taken some trips, you know, you got to get planning and organized for them, Right? So if you went on a camping trip or maybe a whitewater raft trip, you know, you'd get organized. You'd probably pull out your equipment and check it. You know, you'd pull out the tent and set it up maybe in your yard and look it over. Or you'd pull out the whitewater raft and inflate it and check it all out. And you'd want to also check out maybe life preservers or safety equipment or food, you know, whatever it is. You, you prepare. Well, Peter and James and John went up on this mountain with Jesus. They had no preparation. No, they, they weren't prepared for, the, for a transfiguration, were they? But did they really need to be prepared? I don't think they needed knowledge, head knowledge about Jesus. No, I don't think they even needed to know Jesus' plans for the church, you know, Pentecost. What they really needed Peter, James, and John needed was to really just look right at Jesus. Yeah, they really needed to look right at him. And in fact, you know, we sang that song, keep your eyes, right? Keep your eyes watching Jesus. That's it. Peter and James and John, that's really what they needed. They needed to trust Jesus, to love him, uh, to believe in him with all their heart and soul. And, uh, and if they did that, well, then they were ready for whatever journey Jesus was going to take them on. That's what they really needed. Transfiguration, just as a word, means a change in appearance or, or a change in form. And, of course, in school, we learned that what? The caterpillar changes into the butterfly or the moth, right? Or if we had transformers... Yeah, we know all that stuff. Well, Jesus changed. He changed. Jesus changed in the eyes of Peter into the very Son of God. 
the disciples heard Jesus' voice. And they, they saw in Jesus in glistening white robes, and they saw the cloud come down, and then they heard the voice of God. They even saw Elijah and, Elijah and Moses. Now, of course, looking back, P Jesus didn't take Peter and James and John up on the mountain, Mount Tabor, we think. He didn't take them up there for a picnic, did he? No, no picnics. He didn't even take them up there, let's say, just for, to be tourists. No, Jesus took them up on the mountain to witness his glory, to witness the glory of God the Father. And he wanted to mold these disciples into his leaders, the leaders of the early church. Well, God is very ready in the next 40 days to transfigure you as well. Yeah, God wants to mold you into his disciple in this church. So are you ready to be formed and molded? You know, Peter and James and John, if you look at the Gospel of Mark, in general, the disciples are not treated with a lot of respect there. They tend to not get it. You know, they stumble, they fumble. Jesus does something and they just, you know, duh. It, it. So they, they, if I call them confused and slow learners, they kind of miss the point of Jesus' ministry, but eventually they did get it. Well, Lent, of course, as, as Pam announced, begins this Wednesday. And, and it's time for us to have a 40-day transfiguration period into God's faithful disciples. So go home and clear off your desk and find your Bible. Go home and clear off your calendar and find time for study and following in Lent. Yeah. You know, the, the congregation, we're going to be reading a book as a congregation. And it's a book, uh, and the title of it is Living the Six Marks of Discipleship, Real Faith for Real Life by Pastor Mike Foss. Now, that particular book has six marks of discipleship. There will be six sessions. Duh. And there are four leaders. I'm one of them and Patty Abel, and Danny Steele, and, and Kathy Kohler. Thank you. Four different ones of us are leading this. You can pick your time and look over the schedule and, and come, and, and because you're going to love this book. It's really a very good book, and it, you're, you'll have rich fellowship together with you know, new people that you don't know and some you do know, and you will be transfigured. You will be made holy and transformed and molded and shaped into God's vessel. There's a good command in this gospel lesson. It says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen, listen to Jesus. It's an important part of our Lenten journey indeed to listen to Jesus. And we open our Bibles because that's where God's word is. God's word has the power indeed to transform us, to transform the coldest heart. And yeah, we don't want to look at TV or the internet or success or power. They, they will fail us. Rather, we open our hearts to God's word for our lives. And we'll let this word just kind of seep into us, if you will, and become part of that Lenten journey. In Lent, there are often people undertake disciplines. You know, as Pastor Reeson talked about it this morning, he said, oh, people, they give up chocolate, they do all sorts of stuff. But I would hope that you undertake these kinds of disciplines in your 40-day journey. I'd hope you have daily Bible reading, a daily time of prayer, and give yourself into the needs of some other person. Who can you take care of during Lent who really needs help and comfort and care? God, and as we read God's word, then God's word kind of confronts us gently sometimes, sometimes harshly, confronts our weakness, our arrogance, our disobedience. But God, God's word will also comfort us and teach us mercy 
for our brothers and our sisters. And we're going to see the depth of God's love. Because God's going to go to any length to make sure you're right here every Sunday. Yeah, God wants you here. And that's what the Holy Spirit is working on. Well, now the journey ends on April 1st, which is April Fool's Day. The journey begins on February 14th. St. Valentine's Day. I don't know how the calendar got arranged this way. Isn't this interesting? <laughs> anyway, so April 1st is Easter Sunday this year, April Fool's Day. Yeah, and, but the journey, of course, continues after April the 1st, uh, and the journey continued for Peter and James and John, as I said, their whole life. Uh, they just kept going. Uh, Jesus helped them think about things. I mean, think of Peter and James and John. What happened with the crucifixion and the resurrection? Well, they ran off and hid. <laughs> yeah. They, they were afraid. But Jesus kept transforming them, transfiguring them. Jesus didn't give up on them, and he's not going to give up on us. And the whole, the whole early church, Jesus kept forming and transfiguring those people to the end of their lives. I guess I'm saying it's Lent don't be too hard on yourself. Rather, Jesus is on the journey with you too through these 40 days. Yeah, and the journey will continue until such a time as, as our God, God's kingdom comes in its full glory. And that day, far in the future perhaps, maybe near in the future, but on, on that occasion, we will be there with Peter, James, and John, and yeah, we'll get to see it. We'll get to hear God's voice. We'll get to see Jesus on that day with his dazzling white robes. We'll meet Moses and Elijah and many of the other saints. Just two final thoughts here. You'll notice in the gospel lesson, Peter was so terrified, he said, hey, let's build three dwellings, three booths. Well... I think Peter was just nervous, you know, kind of, got to do something. <laughs> well, we don't need booths or dwellings for the journey. Oh, no, we need Jesus, his blood, his love, his mercy. That's what we need. And secondly, our culture likes transfigurations. We like transformations. Uh, you know, you think of... Think of a story of a person maybe who was, say, addicted to drugs, and then they get off of the drugs, and pretty soon they're sober and they're leading a straight life and they really go forward. We love those stories. Yeah, those stories give us hope. Now, a second example of this, my wife's favorite television program at the moment is Fixer Upper with Chip and Joanna Gaines. Yeah. Well, why do, why do we like that? Well, they take an old dowdy house, right, that's looking kind of sad, and they, you know, do all their miracle working, and then what do they do? I love this. They line the person up on the street, yeah, and then they push back the walls, and the person goes, ah! <laughs> they see their new house, right? Sure. What this does, we like that stuff because it's, it's transforming, it's transfiguring, it's hope, it's a future. It's, a, it's just so wonderful to see. So we begin our Lenten journey with hope because we identify with Jesus. Yeah, he's transforming us right now into his faithful servants. Let's open our heart to him. Amen.